So this gorgeous little thing is Alita Farouk. She was um, a beautiful baby born in January of 1942 in Amsterdam. And she was arrested with her parents in July of 1942. They were sent to Auschwitz on July the 16th. And um, Alita was killed on July the 18th of 1942. That two-day span represents the amount of time that it would take for the train to get from Westerbork in the Netherlands uh, to Auschwitz. And we don't know specifically how baby Alita died. Um, some babies died in the gas chamber with their mamas. Uh, many of them were shot. Later on in the war, when ammunition became more valuable to the Nazis, uh, they actually just dug huge pits um, and set children on fire and just simply threw babies in there as they arrived. And so we don't know how little Alita died, but she died in one of those ways. And um, her parents also died at Auschwitz, her grandparents, her aunts and uncles, all of her cousins, uh, her family. I believe there were 18 people sent to Auschwitz and one of them survived. I am a wife, a mom, a grandmom, a sometimes gardener, and a retired nurse. I am not an artist. In 2017, as part of a New Year's resolution, I decided to try to learn to draw. I had skimmed a library book about drawing years before, and I had tried a few sketches, but like a lot of things, it just got pushed aside because I had other responsibilities. So I bought myself a pad and a pencil, and I began looking on the internet for something to draw, and I pinned pictures of ballerinas and athletes and then one day, a picture of a little boy popped up on the screen, and I can only say that he jumped right off the screen and straight into my heart, and I knew without a doubt that I was supposed to draw him. I didn't know if I could draw him, but he called to me, and I just knew it was heart knowledge. I had an idea that if I used my pencil, not as a pencil, but if I ground it up and I used the dust and I applied it in some really soft way to the paper, that I might be able to capture the softness of a child. I sat down at the kitchen table with my little pile of dust and some Q-tips, and I started drawing this little guy. And I drew his eyes first, and in just three or four hours, he peeked out of the paper at me, literally peeked out as if he were playing hide and seek with me. And I turned to my husband, Ronnie, and I said, oh my gosh, there's a little boy in there. And in three or four days, I would say he was finished, this perfectly beautiful little boy. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, how did I do that? How did that happen? I'm not an artist. I don't know how to do that. I can only say that it was as if he were there in the paper waiting for me all the while. So this beautiful little boy is Hirsch. 
And I absolutely love the fact that he's wearing this little sailor hat and sailor suit. And you know that his mama picked those things out for the day he was going to have his picture made. And she brushed his little hair and fixed him just so all the same things that I've done as a mama and that every mama has done. And um, he was a little boy from Romania. He was from the northern part of Romania, Transylvania. And that territory was ceded to Hungary in 1940. And he and his family continued to live there under very oppressive laws until April of 1944, when they were placed in a ghetto. And then just about a month later in May of 1944, they were um, ordered to the local soccer field uh, for the march through town to the trains that would take them to Auschwitz. And another little boy who survived that march described how terrifying it was with the dogs snarling and barking at them. And that would have been very much the same experience that little Hirsch had. He did survive the train ride to Auschwitz, which many people did not. And he was killed at Auschwitz in May of 1944 when he was five years old. After Hirsch, I started looking for other kids who had died in the Holocaust, but kids for whom pictures remained of the years before the war and before their worlds were shattered. at a time and interestingly there's a degree of shyness about them some of them aren't shy at all and they
you talking about? I thought that was the craziest thing I had ever heard. But I kept telling Mary, this is powerful, this is important. I didn't know exactly how, but I felt like what I was looking at was the beginning of something. I just didn't see what he saw. And then he and his wife both said, you have to keep doing this. This little girl is Simone. Uh, she was a little two-year-old from Brussels in Belgium. Uh, can't you tell that she's two years old? She has a perfect two-year-old expression on her face. She's so mad about the picture. And uh, my husband calls her Little Thundercloud. And he says, you can dress me up and fix my hair, but you can't make me smile for that picture. And it's just so true. And uh, she was arrested with her parents in 1942. Uh, they were sent to Auschwitz. She was gassed immediately on arrival there, August the 2nd, 1942, when she was two and a half years old. I met Mary sometime in the mid-80s, and over the next 20 to 30 years, Mary was a, a great grandmother, mother, nurse, school teacher. That's how I knew Mary. And then one day Mary called and said she and Ronnie would like to meet me. So we met here at the farm and she showed me the first four of the beloved. I really enjoy art. Art, though, doesn't inspire a lot of emotion most of the time. But these left me just dumbfounded, awestruck. Because first of all, it was coming from a person who's not a trained artist. And the impact of seeing these children who died in the Holocaust, it was just overwhelming. There were two little girls in the first four who really, it just broke my heart to know that they had died. I can remember seeing short film clips in rough black and white of the U.S. troops liberating the camps. And what you saw there were skeletons of people walking around and you saw dead bodies shrouded. And so this was the first time that I was able to see children before they went to the camps in a real life portrait. Their eyes there their facial expressions, the way they wore their hair, it all jumps out so realistic that you feel like you might have known this child. I think Mary's motivation in showing them to me was just to get an honest reaction to them. She was very humble about it and she needed some encouragement both from me, from her husband Ronnie and other folks to, to make this, these portraits public. I've known Mary as a nurse, as a friend, as an educator. Uh, I never knew her as an artist. And when she showed me the drawings the first time, I, I just, I couldn't, I really couldn't fathom what I was really looking at. The eyes were so captivating. It was mesmerizing. They were, they were talking to me. They were telling me, don't forget about me. And then I took that spiral notebook and I watched her flip through the pages and the spirals were intact. And I always envisioned an artist who was drawing would go through proof after proof after proof, changing this, changing that. But there they were, one after another. And I don't know if I really understand it. It's really mind boggling to me.
from Mary. And Mary said she wanted to come and visit with me. We didn't know quite what was going on. We were, we were good friends of Mary's, but we wouldn't know why she would come alone, drive from Columbia to Charleston to share something with Belinda. Mary came in with a tote bag. And in that tote bag, she had an artist sketch pad. And she said, you know, Belinda, uh, I've had something really interesting. but in fact it didn't seem particularly out of character to Mary. This is Fanny. Don't you think she is so aptly named? She is such a sparkly beautiful little thing. Perfect name for her. And uh, she was a little girl from Czechoslovakia. She was, um, she lived in a ghetto in Krakow for a number of years during the war and then of course was deported uh, like most of her contemporaries, and died at Auschwitz. And uh, I was giving a talk one day, and somebody asked me, do you think that it was hard to kill her? And I was quite taken aback by the question at that moment, because, of course, for you or me, it would probably be entirely impossible to even think about killing her. But I think that for the people who actually did kill her, it was quite easy because I don't think that they saw the sparkle in her. They didn't see the life. They didn't see the preciousness of her little face. Uh, she was absolutely nothing to them, uh, less important than a speck of dust. And um, I feel a certain pity for people who can't see the beauty of life anymore. that how we teach about the Holocaust has been something that has troubled scholars for 60 years. It's not an easy topic to teach, and it's a topic that is very emotional. 
that pulls at the very essence of humanity. Holocaust scholars uh, generally don't pull in art. These are usually folks from history, from religion, from Jewish studies, from human relations, but they don't usually think about art. Art, of course, transcends language. It is able to speak universally to, to the human soul. Language requires an intellectual understanding of what has been said, and you have to process it intellectually. An image, a photograph, a drawing communicates not only on a visual level, but connects on an emotional level that the barrier of language doesn't interfere with. Thomas Merton wrote about how what we're seeking is not communication, but rather communion. And art takes us to that place of communion. It moves us beyond words, beyond speech, into a place where, where we can become uh, one with, with God. If I say good morning to you in English, it may not mean anything to somebody that's not an English speaker. But if I show a picture of this young child, anyone in the world, in any culture in the world, will understand the meaning of a picture of a young child. I think that the silence of the portrait pulls you into conversation with yourself. No one's telling you what to think and what to feel and what to see. As you go deeper and deeper into the conversation with yourself, with God, with your friends, what you see changes. You get a glimpse into their life in a happy moment. It's comforting to know that they had happy moments. It's deeply disturbing that they reached a time when there was no happy moments. These portraits of these children are far more than a visual experience. It's the experience of getting to know these children, getting to know their stories, above all, knowing what their fate was and why. I think the children allow us to tread into that conversation because it's difficult and, and it, they allow us to investigate and to think and come to terms with or try to come to terms with what happened so that we don't repeat the same mistake. The sketches represent a time of hope, a time of, of innocence, a time of joy, living as ordinary children with families, parents who, who loved them, and yet to know what the rest of the story would mean for them, to know that their little lives were cut short, all because of hatred. These portraits of these children are different from the kind of art that one might collect. These drawings have to be seen in their collectiveness. You need to see them all. And not only do you need to see them, you need to know the story. It's also really striking to me how these children are so ordinary. And that's also part of the beauty. It's the ordinariness of our lives that that's where we often encounter the holy. I think even if you did not know the content as the Holocaust children, the eyes, the expressions, the innocence of these children would connect with people. And then when you relate it to the content of these being the Holocaust children that were destroyed for someone else's political and social gain, then the value of life suddenly becomes apparent and connects across all cultures and all religions. I think that these pictures are timeless, the fact that they're done in the very muted colors and all, and you realize they're just children. And they're not, they were not a complete artwork yet. The colors weren't filled in, their lives weren't filled in yet. I would encourage anybody looking at Mary's drawings to take time to understand the story behind the child. It's kind of hard to look at one of these beautiful little children, and their curls, and their sweet smiles on their face, and realize that there was a system in place to decide that they shouldn't exist. And that's beyond my comprehension. To view the beloved, it's to risk being transformed. It's to risk being changed.
This little guy's name is Israel. He was a little boy from Kishnev in Romania. And um, he's a wonderful example of something about the portraits is that usually these are not actual portraits that I find. Uh, they're usually little tiny three by three black and white pictures from the 1930s. And this particular one is a picture of several little guys out on the street. Uh, they've been playing and they've got their arms around one another. And uh, they just look like a bunch of uh, dusty, dirty little guys who've been out having a good time. And if you look real closely, you'll see that this is actually his little shoulder. He's wearing a big hand-me-down shirt. And I just sort of pictured that his mama put that hand-me-down shirt on him to go out and play in the dust. And in that picture, he happens to be the one who just is looking directly at the camera. So I just pulled him out and did his little portrait. Uh, he was the first one of the beloved children to die. He died in 1941. Uh, the Romanian population turned on their, not on their Jewish neighbors and went door to door, killing them. And in Kishnev, they killed 10,000 Jews in one week. And we don't know specifically the date on which Israel died, but he died during that time. And his paperwork uh, simply says, cause of death, murdered. I can't look at the portraits and see artwork. Uh, what I see is a child. I see sweet little Edith or Israel with his beautiful little curls or Simone with her little mad face. I see Fanny sparkling at us. They're just kids to me. It sounds crazy. There's just no question about it. A retired nurse with no artistic training, drawing pictures of little murdered children. But I see the effect they have on people and I can't stop talking about them, how brave they are. These little courageous people who jumped right off the screen and just said, draw me. And I see the way other people react to them just as powerfully as I did. It's like being in love with your own child. I just can't help telling people how special they are. And of course, I'm not talking about the portraits, I'm talking about the children. When a woman has a baby, after everybody has come and visited, eventually the mom is left alone with that new baby. And in that quiet, she gets to discover that little person the little folds of the ears, the little shape of the mouth, those little eyebrows. And it's something that nobody else shares. It's so sacred and so beautiful. She's intimately familiar with every detail of that little person, every single thing. She could pick her child out of five million children in the world. When I'm drawing, I know without a doubt that that child's mom is right there with me. I feel like I'm sharing in that sacred moment when she came to know her little person and she's sharing with me the moments when I do the same thing. When people describe me and they describe the beloved and they talk about how wonderful the artwork is or they say how talented I am, all of that makes me really uncomfortable. I don't think I'm an artist at all. I'm just a person who has the privilege of finding these kids in the paper and giving them a voice. An artist creates things, and I'm not creating anything at all. I'm recreating what God already created in perfection. I don't take any artistic license with the portraits. Oh my goodness, I wouldn't even know how if I wanted to. The reality is that the children come through me, but not from me. One of the things that seems to surprise people is that I don't practice. I don't sketch. When I draw, I start and I go all the way through. I, I don't erase other than just erasing dust off the page. I'm not an artist. I'm not trained to do things the, the right way. And when I was done with Hirsch, I simply flipped the page and I started on the next one. 
Nobody told me that wasn't the way to do it. So when I say I'm not an artist, I mean I am not an artist. It sometimes feels as though I'm looking over my own shoulder and just watching what my hand is doing. It's not a piece of artwork with a plan. It's more like a process of finding the child and the paper. I just know that the child is there waiting to reveal himself, but I don't know exactly what needs to be done. It's more that I sense that there are these tiny little things, the shape of an eyebrow or just the curve of that little smile, and I know I haven't found it yet. And then this beautiful, magical moment comes where it just turns from a drawing into a child all of a sudden. And I always smile and I say, well, hello, little darling. And I'm finished. I'm done. I, I don't ever say, well, gee, I could make this line better or I could color that more or whatever. When the child says, here I am, then I'm done. She gets to a point. There's, there's a child right there. Hello. And she'll call their name out. And you, know, you first see you hear that and go, you're talking to a picture. Well, why don't you take a look at that picture? You might start talking to it, too. This little guy's name is Leon. He was a little boy from Paris. And um, Leon was arrested with his mom and his older brother. Uh, his brother was 13. And so they were sent to Drancy, which was a holding camp. Uh, outside of Paris, and he was separated from his mom and brother quite deliberately. Um, all kids that were younger than nine years of age were considered by the Nazis to be useless eaters. And what that meant was that they took up calories and they didn't do any work. And so they killed them straight away. There was no you go left, you go right business with them. They were all going to die immediately. And so Leon was taken away from his mama he was held at Drancy uh, in a uh, large industrial complex, uh, just huge rooms the size of football fields with concrete floors, uh, no beds, no diapers, no food, no nothing. Uh, he was there for 10 days without his mama, and then he was sent on Convoy 20 to Auschwitz, which was the first convoy that was made up entirely of children. There were 584 kids on that train uh, without any adults, and um, he was killed when he arrived at Auschwitz in August. Everyone encouraged me to continue to draw more of the babies, and so I did. But it's important to understand that this was never a collection or a project. There was never any decision on my part to go from point A to point B to accomplish something. I didn't know where any of this was going, and I still don't. Um, I simply try to be faithful to the children themselves to shepherd them and to protect them and to allow other people to have these beautiful, sacred experiences with them. But I have no idea where that's taking us. As the year went on, I realized slowly, probably, that this was something I was supposed to do, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do. My first thought was that I would draw 12 of them for the 12 tribes of Israel. But then lo and behold, child number 13 comes along and she says, draw me. And so I thought, well, so much for the 12 tribes. People often ask me how I chose the beloved, but honestly, they choose me. There are hundreds and hundreds of these images online and the ones I end up drawing just speak to me in some way. They sort of become luminescent to me when I'm scrolling through, and I just know that I'm supposed to draw that one. 
I'd say by about July of 2017, there were 26 of the babies. And for the first time, there just wasn't anybody waiting in the wings. And Ronnie came home and he said, how come you're not drawing? And I said, "Um, I don't know. Uh, I may be finished. And I didn't draw for about another month. One night, I was online preparing a talk that I was going to give about the Beloved for a school, and I came across a picture of uh, a pediatrician who ran an orphanage in Warsaw by the name of Dr. Korshak, and he was holding a little orphan girl, and it was just like with Hirsch. I knew immediately. Dr. Korshak was well-known throughout Europe both as a physician and as a children's author. And he never had any children of his own, but he cared for these 200 orphans in Warsaw. And of course, when the Nazis came, they were forced to move the orphanage into the ghetto, where Dr. Korshak fought every day to feed them and to keep them alive. And eventually, the Nazis came for the children and Dr. Korshak, But because of his fame, he had the opportunity to be rescued. And he chose instead to stay with his kids. And he led them two by two down the streets of Warsaw to the train station. And it was hoped after the war that maybe they had been taken somewhere and they had survived. But that was, of course, not the case. Dr. Korshak died with his 200 kids at Treblinka. And suddenly, it all made sense to me. Dr. Korshak gave his life to try to save these little orphan children, even though he was given the option to live. And he made that ultimate sacrifice on their behalf. So there's this beautiful serendipity when people see the 26 Beloved, and then they see Dr. Korshak. And the message changes suddenly from, look at these beautiful children and the sorrow that we're all feeling to, am I Dr. Korshak? Would I have done that? Would I make that kind of sacrifice? It's a perfectly appropriate final portrait. But of course, I take no credit for that. The message was not by design. I drew all 27 portraits with the same first pencil that I bought. And by the time I had finished Dr. Korshak, it was about two inches long. And I used to joke with Ronnie and say, when this pencil is gone, my career is over. I would often draw at the coffee shop. And so most of the people there knew me. And I was in there one day and I was drawing and I asked the staff to keep an eye on my things for a moment. I left the pad and the pencil on the table, as I always do. But when I came back, the pencil was gone. And I inquired, of course, and the staff said no, nobody had been near my things. And I thought it might have rolled onto the floor or something. So I looked and the staff helped me look, but it was nowhere to be found. That pencil accomplished its work and it disappeared. I've never found the identical pencil and I can't even find that exact color anymore. In April of 2017, somebody at a local synagogue had heard about the babies and they asked if I would show them at their Holocaust remembrance. I had the first 12 of the drawings in my art pad and I just sat in the hall and flipped the pages and told the children stories and of course they loved the babies and were moved by them and truthfully I thought that day would probably be the highlight of our journey but one thing seemed to lead to another and so I thought it might be a good idea to get art prints made instead of carrying the originals around everywhere And so I called the State Arts Commission, and the lady very helpfully said to me, "Uh, you need to learn the art world. 
And I said, well, thanks very much. What does that mean? And she went on to tell me, of course, that I needed an art photographer to have art prints made. And I didn't even know there was such a thing as an art photographer. But I ended up finding one who came very highly recommended, who was very experienced and handles international artists. And I set up an appointment. I've been a photographer all my life, ever since the sixth grade when I got hooked on it. I've made my entire career doing photography and imaging of one kind or another. Reproduction photography is not an easy thing to do. You need to capture and retain the feeling of the artist's intention in it, even though it's a technical process. On the appointed day, I sat with Bill and I opened up the art pad and really he didn't react at all and I flipped to the second one and I flipped to the third one and then he stopped me and he said how in the world do you do that and I said well I don't know exactly and he said okay go ahead and I kept going and then he said hang on a minute do you just draw one and then you turn the page and you draw another one? And I said, yes. I thought it was a trick question. And he said, Mary, nobody does that. People do practice drawings and they think about composition and form and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I'm sorry. I don't know anything about those things. Then he said the most horrifying thing that anybody could have said to me at that point in time. He said, I'm going to need you to leave these with me overnight. It was kind of like she was leaving her children with a stranger <laughs> to, be, to be cared for, put to bed and fed and awaken the next morning without her knowing anything about the stranger or, or where they were going to be staying for the night. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I absolutely panicked. I said, could I just come and sit here all day and then just take them back home with me? And he said, you know, Mary, I handle artists from all over the world, and I'll take good care of your artwork. Of course, I was unconvinced, and I finally realized I was going to have to bite the bullet and leave them. And I guess Bill could tell I was in a panic because he said, don't worry, I'll take good care of those babies. And when he said babies, I knew that he got it. And so I left them, and I went out to the car, and I cried like a baby. He asked me to come back at 9 o'clock the next morning to see the proofs. And I got there, and his wife happened to be outside the studio, and she said, he's having a lot of trouble with them. He worked late into the night, and he got up really early this morning to work on them again. And I went inside, and he said, Mary, I don't know what to tell you, but I just can't seem to reproduce these. Uh, technically, it was keeping the softness of the drawings in the reproduction. Most artists that do pencil work do it on white paper and want to just show their pencil work. Uh, Mary wanted to keep the tone and the texture of the paper that she'd originally drawn it on in the reproductions, and it took a little bit of experimentation to make the two things of paper tone and image tone come together. I went back the next day, and he was still struggling, and so I sat down with him at the computer, and we spent hours trying to get something close to the originals we probably had a hundred proofs laying on the floor. And he said to me, you know, Mary, I've been doing this for 40 years. I'm doing things for you I have never done for any other artist. One afternoon, Mary and I were working on the computer trying to get the fine points of editing these images. And my wife, Lynn, walked in and made the comment that it's not easy trying to do a 100% reproduction of something that was miraculously created. This little boy is Georgi. Um, he was a little boy from Hungary, and he was um, two years old when he died at Auschwitz in June of 1944. 
there are two things that I absolutely love about this portrait. The first one is his little eyes are so precious. The expression on his face, he looks like he just can't wait to see what the next great adventure in life is. And I just love that about him. And the second thing is that he has this little tan line going right here. You can tell he had been wearing a little uh, baby T-shirt out in the sun that spring. Must have been warm in April and May because he already had a little tan going. And uh, when I was a little girl in Europe, we always wore those little white T-shirts under every kind of clothing, and we wore them to the beach. And so I related really closely to little Georgie. And uh, he died with his mama at Auschwitz in June of 1944. Mary was, was struggling about how she could um, communicate, share these images with others. And she was initially most interested in how she might do that in the Jewish community. And I knew she'd be appreciated in the Jewish community. In fact, her encounters have been extremely warm. Um, and she, I know she's been moved by her the reaction folks have had. But I explained to her that the more important mission was outside the Jewish community. Many of, of folks my age in the Jewish community have the common experience of having relatives die in the Holocaust. So um, uh, they're the siblings of their grandparents and so forth. So um, the, um, uh, I, I've just got to say that the stronger mission, the stronger mission I told Mary was outside the Jewish community. In July of 2017, through...
time of joy, living as ordinary children with families, parents who loved them. In Judaism, we have a word that's called kvel, which means to be so proud, you kvel. And I think that Mary, by bringing these children back to life through their portraits, their parents are looking down and they're kveling about the pride that they feel that we are being introduced again to their children. And yet to know what the, the rest of the story would mean for them, to know that their little lives were cut short, all because of hatred and the, the inhumanity of that. My husband told me later that evening, Mary, you could have heard a pin drop in there. Nobody moved, nobody took their eyes off of those portraits. And again, I thought, well, this is the biggest thing that's ever going to happen with these portraits. This little girl is Ruth. Isn't she absolutely gorgeous? She was born on Passover in 1939, and we know that she uh, died uh, at Treblinka when she was two years old. And that is absolutely everything that we know about her. She is a child that lots of Holocaust organizations and Holocaust scholars have tried to find information about and just have been unable to do so. There, it appears really that there is nobody left uh, with her surname, that there just is no family left, no parents, no grandparents, no aunts and uncles. And um, so she's just untethered in the world. And if you think about how important um, how much we identify ourselves by who our people are and where we come from and who our relatives are. And we know absolutely none of those things about Ruth. And I think it's really symbolic of the Holocaust overall that she's just a little girl just lost in time and space. The journey of the Beloved has been very surprising to me. I don't see the opportunities coming. I don't realize what's about to happen. Things just happen, and I'm always tremendously surprised. But then again, I'm not surprised because these unusual things just keep happening. Clearly, I'm not the one steering this ship. I got a call from a reporter with a local newspaper who wanted to meet with me, and during the interview, I suppose I was talking, as I usually do, about the babies, like they're alive and how much I love them. And I don't think he had a clue what to make of me at first. And he even admitted to me that when he got the assignment to interview me, that he thought I was going to be a nut job. Those were his words, a nut job. Well, what can I say? It, it's a crazy story, loving children who were murdered 80 years ago. And I think that's the part that probably seems crazy to people. But it just is what it is. Who would plan something like this? I think maybe that's the beauty of life, that we just don't see the extraordinary coming. We don't see the miraculous coming.
This is Edith. Edith was um, just a gorgeous little girl from Tilburg in the Netherlands. And um, she was hidden during the war in a home separately from her parents. And that was not an unusual thing because if someone offered to hide somebody and they themselves did not have children, then it would be very noticeable to other people if a child was heard crying in the house or something like that. And so she was hidden separately from them and eventually was denounced and was deported to Auschwitz where she uh, was killed in October of 1944. Her parents survived the war and they went on to have another uh, daughter and a son. And um, I have had the privilege of being introduced to them and they asked me if they could buy a portrait of their sister and of course I said absolutely not and I sent each of them a portrait and so now Edith is in both her brother and her sister's homes back home with her family. In November of 2017, I was asked to exhibit the portraits at Grace Cathedral in Charleston, and we purchased easels and printed brochures with their little stories in it, and we went down to Charleston and set them up in this beautiful cathedral, and I had the wonderful privilege that night of watching as people met the babies for the first time. Millions of children died in the Holocaust. And what we lost was a very different possibility for the future. All their gifts, all their talents, we were never able to experience. The loss is phenomenal. Well, some people view the Holocaust as a distant historic memory, something that, that happened in the distant past. In my life, that really wasn't the, the image in my family. My, my family lost family members in the Holocaust. So that was very much a part of my childhood that I knew people whose parents had perished, whose siblings had perished. They were my cousins. And, and that was very much part of, of my growing up that I knew these relatives very well. I believe that human beings have the capacity for enormous good and for enormous evil and the period of the Holocaust and what happened to the Jews I think in very very stark terms addresses that. We need to be reminded of this history so we don't repeat it again. The younger generation that are my children and my grandchildren won't know anything about this or have any emotional connection to it unless we remind them. Well, obviously the Holocaust is, is about the Jewish race but it's much more than that. If one country, one government can do this to the Jewish population, another government at another time could do it to any other ethnic group. It seems to me in our world, and I suspect it's, it's true of every generation, but we are in need of, of sight. We need to be able to see. We're in need of insight. And so the beloved provides sight and insight. We see their pictures, we see their beautiful faces, we see their eyes and their smiles and, and it is through sight, it is through insight that we cease to become blind, blind to the injustices in our world around us. I think one of the very important aspects of tolerance is that we recognize the humanity and others and you know the humanity of these children uh, uh, is apparent I mean it, it, and the fact that they happen to be Jewish kids is almost an afterthought I mean they are they are first children almost everybody loves a child almost everybody feels protective toward a child any one of us if we saw a three-year-old run out into the street, we would run right after them. 
Children have this way of breaking down barriers of every kind. It really doesn't matter what your race is, what your religion is, what your political beliefs are. There's just this wonderful purity to children that transcends all of that. You know, there's so many things in the world that divide us. And there's very few things that we can all agree on, no matter what part of the globe you live in, what your thoughts are, your religions are. The one thing I think everybody can agree on is that that was a senseless murder of one and a half million children. Especially given the level of division and animosity and even hatred and injustice that all exist in today's world. Mary offers us a new way, uh, a different way of relating to one another. And it's through these beautiful children that we are able to be reminded that every single human life is worthy. Every single human life is is precious. They open a conversation within yourself, which hopefully opens the conversation in the community and within churches and synagogues and mosques. And we begin to talk about how we're to treat one another. I think these drawings are a profound gift to give the rest of us an opportunity to take a breath and look and rethink what we think about life and how we think others ought to be treated, whoever they are, wherever they are. When I first saw them, there was a clear message to me that these were the conduit to reminding people of the atrocities that have happened in the world. And while that was my initial reaction, I've had other reactions to them over the past few years. And as other people have seen them, their reactions have been different. So the, the portraits mean something different to everyone. It's, it's an individual reaction and there's just so much good comes out of causing people to think about these issues. I think that these children really portrayed love. They were so capable of giving love and receiving love. And then if you take the fact these million and a half children, their ability to love was cut off and all the love that they could have spread through the world. That's really one of the greatest losses of the Holocaust was losing all of the love that these children, these million and a half children had to share. Think about your own children, the love and devotion that you feel for them, the care that's lavished upon them from the moment they're born. Every little need met, every concern that they have addressed, everything done so lovingly by parents and grandparents. Well, that was true of these kids too. They were somebody's precious, precious child. They weren't nothing. They weren't worthless. And everything in me rejects that notion and just cries out and says, no, they did have value. I think the value of Mary's work is that it shows that these children had value and that they deserved to live and that their life was taken away from them by evil means. And we need to be reminded that that should not happen again on this planet. It seems to me that these children are on a mission. These children have stories that, that need to be told. Their stories are able to, to transform our own lives as we learn their stories and we commit ourselves to a future, God willing, without hatred, uh, without discrimination. I think that we convince ourselves in some way, that we're more valuable than other people, that people who are different from us have some value, but perhaps not as great as the value we ourselves have. And the babies just don't allow us to believe that. They're incredibly gentle little teachers, but they're unrelenting in saying to us, we are all the beloved. Let's cut through all the extraneous titles this is a child of the Lord who happened to grow up at a time when certain children, due to characteristics they had absolutely nothing to do with, made them expendable. And I really think Mary's doing a wonderful job of saying, no, 